Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us again for the third and final part of our workshop entitled Livestock Biotechnology Center Virtual Seminar on GM Animals for Philippine Biotech Regulation. Once again, my name is Mitch Ann Gabriel Arbondok, and I'm your host, I, I am your host for today's session. We appreciate you taking time of your busy schedules to join us again. And we hope you will find the program we have lined up for you to be beneficial and captivating. We are indeed grateful to have you here with us. We have about 30 participants for today's session from the Department of Agriculture Regional, uh, Regional Field Office 2, the ARFO5, the ARFO8, the ARFO12, the ARFO Cordillera Administrative Region, the A Bureau of Animal Industry, the A Philippine Caribou Center, the A Bureau of Fisheries and Aquatic Resources, the A Quirino Experiment Station, the A RFO2 Nueva Vizcaya Experiment Station, Department of Environmental and Resource, uh, Natural Resources, Environmental Management Bureau, Department of Science and Technology, Department of Health, Food and, uh, and Drug Administration, in uh, International Service for the Acquisition of Agribiotech Applications, DOH Biosafety Committee, United States Department of Agriculture, Foreign Agricultural Service, and DA Biotechnology Program Office. And before we continue today po sa ating um, session, allow me to introduce one of our staff here at LBC, Sir John Louis P. Baligad, a Science Research Specialist one here at the Philippine Carabao Center, and he will do the recap of the topics that we have talked about yesterday. Good morning, sir. Hello, uh, good morning, everyone. Hey, uh, thank you so much po, for uh, staying with us at the uh, TV uh, webinar series for on the uh, uh, seminar workshop on GM animals for uh, Philippine biotech regulators. So, again, uh, in open na po yung ating uh, short PowerPoint presentations to uh, give you uh, a short recap on. Uh, what we have uh, talked about yesterday. So, <clears throat> okay, so we keep an up. We keep an up on us at screen. Okay, so again, uh, allow me to uh, give you a short recap on what we had uh, talked about yesterday. So yesterday we had uh, uh, talked about three topics. And first topic is uh, about the agricultural biotechnology and climate change, which is presented by the uh, university professor, director of uh, ISEM at the Central Luzon State University, Dr. Annie uh, Melinda Paz Alberto. And she began uh, her presentation with uh, 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 the uh, definition uh, of climate change as well as its causes and consequences. And she uh, defined uh, class climate change as change in climate which attribute to human activity that alters the composition of global atmosphere. And of course, in addition to that is the natural climate variability observed over the comparable uh, time of periods, which is uh, cited, uh, uh, Dr. Ani cited the definition of the UNFCCC, okay. And again, the climate change is uh, actually basically from uh, the natural causes and the human induced. So, and as a result, climate change threatens your food security, okay, uh, the higher typhoons, uh, drought risk and flood risk, and et cetera. Now, she also mentioned or highlighted the, uh, from her presentation that uh, in order to understand fully understand uh, the uh, climate change, we first uh, uh, understand the uh, concept of greenhouse effect. 
Okay, so she uh, mentioned a lot of uh, examples there, uh, a lot of slides to uh, def uh, to uh, discuss the concept of greenhouse effect. And also from her presentation, he, she uh, mentioned the agricultural contribution to climate change. So in the agriculture, as a source of greenhouse gases, for example, the CH CH is H4 from rice and the livestock production and etc. And also she highlighted the ways on how agricultural biotechnology can mitigate and adapt to climate change. So uh, a lot of uh, examples, slides there to discuss on how to uh, agricultural biotechnology can mitigate and adapt to climate change. And one of the uh, important uh, topic that she uh, discussed yesterday is the concept of sustainable climate smart agriculture. And uh, she emphasized that uh, the pro productivity adaptation and mitigation or the three pillars of the CSA or the concept of sustainable climate smart agriculture to in order to, to uh, address this uh, uh, climate change uh, effect. Okay. And uh, Another thing is that agricultural biotechnology products addressing the climate change also. And climate smart agriculture and biotechnology can uh, uh, ultimately play a very important role, okay, with the smart agriculture for improving agricultural, agricultural productivity, attaining food security, protecting our environment from adverse effects of climate change and climate change adaptation and mitigation strategies. So, uh, uh, we will send you for you a copy of no, the presentation just to uh, uh, give you a reference okay, for, to what they are uh, discuss as the uh, topic. Okay. And for the second uh, presentation, the topic agricultural biotechnology and organic agriculture uh, presented by Dr. Abraham G. Manalo of the uh, Biotechnology Coalition of the Philippines. Uh, he also uh, started his uh, presentation on the definition and explanation of organic agriculture. And Sir Avi Manalos highlighted the definition and explanation of organic agriculture, wherein there are many explanations and definitions for organic agriculture, but all converge to state that it is a system, okay, that relies on uh, uh, ecosystem management rather than the external agricultural input. So in other words, it is a system of uh, eliminating okay, the use of synthetic inputs, such as the synthetic fertilizers, pesticides, veterinary drugs, genetically modified seeds and breeds, preservatives, additives, irrigations, and so on. So also from his presentation, he uh, presented to us the four principles of organic agriculture, the uh, principle of health, ecology, okay, and the uh, princi uh, principle of the earth. And also, uh, she emphasized or highlighted the Philippine organic agriculture standards, the relevant section of the uh, uh, PNS, BAPS 07 2003 for crops, livestock, and for processing. So, for livestock, so uh, on the animal breeds and uh, breeding, the use of genetically engineered species or beads is not allowed, okay? And the following products shall not be included, nor added to the feed or any other by given to farm animals. Or uh, in other words, GE organisms or product thereof, generally no synthetic chemical father preservatives are allowed, and the fol following may be used alternative, the bacteria, fungi, enzymes. And GLI by vaccine shall not be so. Yun po yung uh, uh, scope po no uh, uh, for livestock po no at the PNS vaccine so the two thousand. And also from uh, his presentation, he uh, cited the uh, World Organic Agricultural Land and Region shares of the global organic agriculture in 2019, as a, as well as the world distribution of the organic areas in 2019. So he, he also presented the list of organic farms accredited, accredited by the BAPS. We have uh, donated it from the Victoria Oriental Mindoro, 
poultry and livestock from the Bagabag Nueva Vizcaya. We have the uh, animal production, or organic production sa Agilipay Quirino, poultry and livestock sa Santiago Isabela. Also, from his presentation, he uh, discussed the global area of biotech crops from 1996 to, to 2019, kung paano po siya nag-grow, kung paano po lumawak yung ating mga areas na pinagtatam na po nung ating mga biotech crops, okay? And also, the global adaptation rates for principal biotech crops 2019 were in the... Uh, and also po yung ating mga Pinoy GMOs, for example po yung uh, technology or yung research uh, developed uh, technology po ng UPLB, yung delay, uh, delayed ripening papaya, the BT cotton and BT eggplant and the golden rice. So discuss na din po yan uh, one by one kung paano po yung maging process or paano uh, na yung ginawang process sa uh, regulatory uh, aspect po hanggang sa uh, matanggap po sa uh, uh, for human consumption. Okay. For the uh, coexistence between the biotech and organic farming, he, uh, he discussed the definition of coexistence, the common objective of biotech and organic agriculture, the reg uh, some uh, regulatory differences, okay, and how can we practice coexistence with the different planting times, use of buffer zones, so, uh, sufficient distance between farms for and physical isolation. First essential step is the neighboring farmer must not talk with each other. And he also discuss one by one the principles of coexistence. And uh, for the last speaker, uh, Dr. Yoprasina P. Atabay discussed the agricultural biotechnology and livestock. And he, her presentation, she started uh, with the introduction of the, the APCC as a lead agency in livestock biotech in the A, okay, by virtue of the uh, Administrative Order Number 9, series of 2008, where in the PCC Car uh, Carabao Development Program uh, includes the genetic improvement, Buffalo-based enterprise research and development. She also uh, highlighted the R&D or the R4D agenda of the APCC, the breeding and genetics, reproduction and physiology, animal health and biosafety, animal nutrition, product development, social econ and policy research. And of course, he also uh, uh, highlighted that the Philippine Carabao uh, made the source of milk and meat, okay? And of course, she, uh, she also emphasized the uh, transforming Philipp uh, Philippine agriculture one key agenda key strategies. And the programs, technologies developed and utilized uh, by the uh, PCC, okay, from uh, different areas like the repro and reproduction and physiology, with the fixed time AI, enhanced AI, ultrasonography, early pregnancy diagnosis, and etc. And for the major outputs, these technologies resulted in more precise timing of AI, thus improving pregnancy and increase milk production, food production sustainability, and genetic conservation. And another areas is that for the uh, programs that develop technologies, the uh, breeding and genetics, animal nutrition, animal health, product processing, and development. So as I have said earlier, we will send you for the uh, copy of their presentation uh, for your reference book. And once again, uh, we have uh, uh, two topics. Okay, more, we still have two more topics to be discussed and sana po ay mas matutupap po tayo para mas maging uh, fruitful po at sulit po yung ating pag-attend sa ating po, uh, virtual seminar workshop on GM, GM Animals for Philippine Biotechnologies. Once again po, thank you so much. And uh, I request uh, Ms. MC to take over the uh, Zoom room. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you so much po, Sir Louis Baligad. And before we begin po, I'd like to share a few reminders po ulit sa ating mga participants. First, please be informed that this workshop is being recorded. And while speakers are in session, you may send your comments and questions to the chat box down below. And please remember to whom you're addressing the question to. Also, in asking you may introduce yourself at the end of the session. 
And after po nung ating open forum, we will have a post test po. Okay po. Thank you po. Okay, so I think everyone is ready to listen and learn from our invited resource speakers. With that, let us now proceed to our first speaker this morning. Our first speaker is a program uh, associate of the uh, International Service of, uh, for the Acquisition of Agribiotech Applications and has a decade worth of experience in science communication. She finished her uh, BS Biology major in Zoology from the University of the Philippines, Los Baños. She currently leads the development of education and information materials on biotechnology and science communication, having authored over 20 publications on various topics. She is the editor-in-chief of the Crop Biotech Update, a weekly e-newsletter on modern biotechnology that re uh, reaches over 25,000 subscribers globally. She also leads the con uh, conduct of communication research related to biotechnology and science communication with published uh, published scholarly articles in Philippine Journal of Crop Science and International Journal of Current Research. Ms. Tome calls herself as a science storyteller. Uh, storyteller as she also managed the social uh, social media campaigns of ISAA and gives training on how to harness the power of social media storytelling to promote science and technology here and um, abroad here and locally and internationally. In 2016, she won third place in the International Rice Research Institute's writing contest on Miracle Rice R uh, IR8. Ladies and gentlemen, to present the introduction to public speaking and communicating biotechnology, please join me in welcoming Ms. Christine Grace N. Tome. Thank you, ma'am. Good morning. Um, let me share my screen now. Okay. Can you see it now? Yes, Pa. Okay. Um, thank you so much for that very kind introduction. Good morning, everyone. I'm Tin and I'm sp speaking now from Los Baños. So I would like to make this um, session engaging since, since we're talking about communication. So you may use the chat box. I'll open the chat box. So I can see your answers. Whenever I have questions, please answer them on the chat box. And feel free to use the React buttons as well. So I hope everybody had their breakfast already because you would need that energy to learn and relearn some important topics today. So after this talk, I hope that you will be refreshed with basic principles and practical guidelines on public speaking. And we'll dive deep into science communication, particularly on biotech communication. And I wish to equip you also with reliable in, um, sources of information on modern biotechnology. So this will be a one hour talk. And please um, tap on the thumbs up button on uh, the react buttons there to let me know if you're ready. Okay. So I love public speaking. Um, last year, I took a Gallup Strength test, and I found out that my top strength is not actually communication, but being strategic. So it's thrilling for me to strategize on how to express my ideas so that the audience could appreciate and understand them more. And I could totally relate to this quote by Daniel Webster. He's an American politician in early 1900s. He's not the father of Webster's Dictionary. That's actually his cousin, Noah. So he said, if all my talents and powers were to be taken from me by some inscrutable providence, and I had my choice of keeping but one, I would unhesitatingly ask to be allowed to keep the power of speaking, for through it, I would quickly regain the rest. So it's a clever thought, as Ernie Baron, if you know him, as Ernie Baron used to say, knowledge is power. Webster says here, excuse me, bro, speech is more powerful. So if you can voice out your knowledge effectively and confidently, 
that's actually an immense power that is not given to everybody. So as regulators, you have that special knowledge that gives you the position and power to speak. So let me be your guide as we dive into the um, public speaking principles and make Webster proud. So when we're talking about public speaking, we're actually talking about rhetoric. I know you've heard this word before, and through the years, this word has come to have a negative connotation. If, if they say you're a rhetoric speaker, they would mean uh, you're insincere or you're talking some insignificant details. But let me redefine to you rhetoric. It's the art of effective communication using specialized tools. What are the specialized tools? These are figures of speech and composition, other compositional techniques. So rhetoric has been a continuous field of learning in the time of Aristotle and the gang sometime 2,500 years ago. So there are age-old principles that have been studied through the years and the center of it is the canons of rhetoric. So this is the roadmap on speaking in front of an audience. So I tweaked it a bit. So the sound of canons of rhetoric sounds so traditional and old. So I tweaked it to make it more modern and easier to remember and came up with the five P's of public speaking. So first is topic, then trace, trend, thought, and tell. So for the first one topic, it's when you, you, when you start with your speech, when you prepare for your speech, you think first of what is the main content of your speech because content is king and everything will follow from there. Number two is trace. That's how you will organize your speech. So you have to think how your speech will sound real time and that depends on how you arrange your key points. Number three is trend or the style, because now you know what you're going to talk about, you know how you're going to order your key points, and then now you should know how you're going to deliver your speech. Number four is thought. So this is the part where you would um, do your best to strategize on how to retain your speech in your memory. And number five is tell. So this is delivering your speech with confidence. Now let me discuss to you this tease one by one. So topic. So when you're preparing for your speech, you have to think of the answers to these questions. What am I talking about? Why am I talking about it? What am I going to be talking about next? So as you notice, it is not a linear flow of of ideas because you're going to go forward with an, with an idea and then go backward a bit and then go forward again and, and so on. So it's like uh, an episode of at Netflix wherein you will have a preview of what's going to happen, and then the episode itself, and then at the end you will get a review of what happened in the episode. So you're giving cues to your audience for them to easily understand your points. So we have here two time two types of cues that would help your audience to understand easily your speech. First is the contextual cues. So this is um, wherein you were repeat some parts of your speech again and again to reinforce the relationship of that idea to the following ideas. It's like when you're reading a book, you flip back a page to see, ah, this is related to this because of this. So next is the persodic cues. So this refers to the tone, intonation, stress, pitch, word accent, length, and so on. Just like when you say the words, yeah, I like that song. You can also say it, yeah, I like that song. So those are just the same set of words, but delivered in two sets of prosodic cues. So they have, they delivered different messages. So when you write your speech, remember that you should write for the ear and not for the eyes because writing content for reading is different from writing content for speaking. Form and content influence one another. You can just write an essay and read it aloud. Um, because of visual techniques of writing don't automatically translate to speech. For example, if you read, if you've read Harry Potter, you can just you cannot just read the lines from the Harry Potter book 
and read it aloud and turn it into a movie. You have to rewrite it again so that it will sound good in the movies. So first, let's talk about your sentences. Um, we are taught to write in proper sentences, but we don't speak that way. You can write long sentences and that's okay for the reader, but it's not okay if you're gonna listen to it. And in terms of vocabulary, when you're um, writing for speech, there are more hedging devices and intensifiers. What are hedging devices? Examples are sort of, kind of, intensifiers are very, really. So those are just some examples of words that you don't usually write, but you can hear a lot when you're hearing a speech. So when you also um, read a script, and don't deliver extemporaneously, you will see that there are less pitch variations or the high and low tones. So you can do this actually, you just write your script and memorize it and then perform. But that's not public speaking, it's acting. So after finalizing your topic, you have to trace out the key points which goes to our next T, trace. So the skeleton of your speech must contain key points. You have to discuss each key point with concrete and interesting examples. So this design works because it follows how audiences hear and process information in chunks. So you have to plan out the relationship through, throughout your speech through an outline or pattern. And so how do we organize our key points? That depends on your purpose and your audience. So these are the basic speech patterns, topical, chronological, spatial, problem solution, cause effect. So topical is the most used because it fits most cases. And chronological, you can talk about the past, present and in the future. Spatial, if you're going to talk about different locations, you started one location, then another location, then the next. If you're going to talk about um, something that you want to persuade your, your, your audience through a persuasive speech, you can use the problem solution or the, or the cause effect. So let's talk more about the topical speech pattern because this is the most used, in, especially in our field of practice. You start with an introduction, you know this already. You have to start with a hook. So just like what I did, I started with a quotation. It could be also a statement or a question that will grab the attention of your audience. Next, you go to your main points. So in this example, I placed three main points. You might be asking, what is the perfect number of main points that we can put in a speech? Well, there's no perfect, perfect answer for that, but we... The ideal is two to five key points. If you came up with 17 points, I'm sure you can, you can still find a way to put them together and come up with just two to five key points. This is tough. This requires skills, um, experience, and good judgment. So let me just give you some guidelines. So your main points must relate and give details, explain more about your main topic and then your main points should work together and don't overlap each other you have to check on this when you're you've already written your your pattern or your outline and most importantly your audience must be able to recognize the logic of your arrangements especially if you're not showing a slides so at the end, after explaining your main points, you can go to your summary and reiterate the relationships of the key points. And at the end, have a call to action, or this is an invitation for your audience to do something after hearing what you said. So for example, if you delivered an informative speech, you can ask them to learn more. You can ask them to share the information that they have just learned. So now let's go to the next T, which is trend. I said this a while ago about prosody. So prosody, it's um, the blend of words and ideas. So that sound echoes the sense. 
So it's important that you already know what you're going to say, you know the order of your key points. It's now time to stylize using prosodic cues. So these are the characteristics of speech. Your rhythm, intonation, stress, pitch, volume, pause, beat, and so many others. So these um, characteristics provide auditory details to your speech. So let's start with breathing. So it's very important that you have proper breathing whenever you talk. It's, but most probably, when you're going to speak in public, you feel nervous first. It's very natural. And what happens is that your heartbeat becomes fast and your breathing becomes shallow and, and you're getting running out of breath. So what's the solution to this? You have to do diaphragmatic breathing, deep breaths. That will activate your diaphragm and then you de inhale deeply and then exhale, push out the air. So this gives your voice energy and projection. And it, it will be easier to speak as well if you sit or stand straight without leaning or you're on your chair if you're on Zoom. So in theater, what they do to let go of the nervousness and to breathe properly is that they inhale deeply inhale for five seconds and then exhale using the S sound and then pushing the, the tummy. So you, it's like this inhale. So they do that for one to two minutes. And another thing to, that you could do is to roll your tongue with closed mouth clockwise and then counterclockwise. So it relaxes your facial muscles. Some um, good speakers also say this, they dance. They dance before they go on stage. So if you have your own room or, or there's a nearby washroom, before you speak um, in front of the audience, you can go to that and, and dance. And it really releases your energy and puts you in the mood to speak well. Next is projection. So projection is not just volume. It is the strength of your voice. You have to use your voice um, powerfully and clearly. So what is the right mix? So if, if you're doing a, a talk on a physical space with a physical audience, you have to fill the space with sound, of course, with the help of your microphone. And if you're doing it on Zoom, just make sure also that your mic is good and that your voice sounds good through your mic. So next is pitch. So this is the high and low tones. And it's just important you deliver your speech extemporaneously and not read it verbatim or memorize it verbatim so that you will get the right mix of pitch. We want our audience to easily comprehend our message and understand its important parts. And the invaluable tools to achieve this are rate repetition and pauses. So we have to slow down when you're delivering important lines, have pauses that can direct attention, but avoid very long pauses because it might be hard for your audience to process the information. So let's have a recap. I've opened my chat. What are the three T's? Can you type in the three T's? Okay. So if you remember that, I know somebody answered through their mind or check out their notes. So if you remember the three T's, you're good to go to the four T, which is, yeah, thank you for, thank you for your answer, Roxanne. So for the next T, thought. So Roxanne, Mark Tan has good memory. Rosella, thank you. Now you're good to go for the next T, which is thought. So there are people who are proficient speakers who can do extemporaneous speech because they have already devoted a lot of time talking about that certain topic and they don't get nervous anymore when they go on stage. But before they were able to achieve that state of proficiency, they went through hours and hours of practice. And that's the key to a well-delivered speech. You have to practice. I know you hate it. Me too. I hate practicing because it's very time-consuming. I woke up early this morning to practice one more time. and But I hate it more that I would um, look bad here on Zoom because I did not practice. I hate that more. So even if I hate practicing, I did practice. So how do we do it? 
first you write your script in full sentences per slide or you do it the other way around. You write your script and then you do your slide and then practice delivering your speech. After that, if you've already um, mastered your, your script, you can shorten the script into shorter phrases and then practice again. And then if you think you're more confident, clip the phrases into shorter keywords and then practice again. And you can revise your slides in the process. So how many times should you practice? Three to four times, but it may not be enough. You will know if you need more practice. So you don't need to memorize because you might forget and black out. This happened to me um, when I was singing a song. I forgot a specific line in the lyrics and it was instantly an unforgettable moment. So that's why we don't memorize. And it also doesn't sound natural. And if you forget something while you're doing your talk or your speech, you don't hurt yourself alone. You're also hurting your audience because they will feel bad about what's happening with you. When you are well rehearsed and something surprising happens, for example, you're going on stage, you're holding the mic already, and then you're a bit clumsy and accidentally trip on stage, you can still get up and deliver because you know the talk deeply. So finally, we're on our last T, and this is tell. So let me share a video. Hear that? That's nothing. Which is what I, as a speaker at today's conference, have for you all. I have nothing. Nada. Zip. Zilch. Zippo. Nothing smart. Nothing inspirational. Nothing even remotely researched at all. I have absolutely nothing to say whatsoever. And yet, through my manner of speaking, I will make it seem like I do. <laughs> like what I am saying is brilliant. And maybe, just maybe, you will feel like you've learned something. Now, I'm going to get started with the opening. I'm going to make a lot of hand gestures. I'm going to do this with my right hand. I'm going to do this with my left. I I'm going to adjust my glasses. And then I'm going to ask you all a question. Uh, by show of hands, how many of you all have been asked a question before? OK, great, I'm seeing some hands. And again, I have nothing here. <laughs> now, I'm going to react to that and act like I'm telling you a personal anecdote. Something to break the tension. Something to endear myself a little bit. <laughs> something kind of uh, embarrassing. <laughs> and you guys are going to make an awe sound. Aww. It's true. It really happened. <laughs> and now I'm going to bring it to a broader point. I'm going to reel you back in. I'm going to make it intellectual. I'm going to bring it to this man right here. Now, what this man did was important, I'm sure. <laughs> but I, for one, have no idea who he is. I simply Google image the word scientist. <laughs> and now, you see, I'd like it to seem like I'm making points, building an argument, inspiring you to change your life. When in reality, this is just me buying time. Now, if you don't believe me, let's take a look at the numbers. This is a real thing that's happening right now. <laughs> the number of talks that I'm giving is one. <laughs> Interesting facts imparted thus far in said talk. Well, that's going to be a zero. <laughs> My height in inches is 70.5. Note the 0.5 there. 2 times 6 equals 12. And then interestingly enough, 6 times 2 also equals 12. That's math. 352 is a three-digit number. One, two, three, four, five. And then almost immediately following that, we get six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 
Now, to add more filler here, I'm going to give you a couple more numbers to consider. Uh, 18, 237, 5,601, 2.6 million, 4, 4, 24, staggering. These are real numbers, all of them. And to follow that up, let's take a look at some graphs. Now, if you take a look at this pie chart, what you're going to see is that the majority far exceeds the minority. Everybody see that? Cool, isn't it? And let's take a look at this bar graph, because it shows similarly irrelevant data. Now, I'm doing this because I'd like to make it seem like I've done my homework. If you were, say, watching this on YouTube with the sound off, you might think, huh, OK. This guy knows what he's talking about. But I don't. I'm floundering, panicking. I've got nothing. I'm a total and utter phony. But you know what? I was offered a TED Talk. And damn it, I'm going to see it through. <laughs> now, if you take a look behind me, these are just words paired with <laughs> vaguely thought-provoking stock photos. I'm going to point at them like I'm making use both of my time as well as your time, but in reality, I don't know what half of them mean. And now, as these continue, I'm just going to start saying gibberish. Wagga wa, gabba gabba, turkey, mouth in a mouth, chip, trip, my dog skip, rip it and dip it, Richard. I'm an itty bitty baby bopper, and I'm hungry in my tum tum. Brad Pitt, Uma Thurman. Names, things, words, words, and more things. And see, it feels like it might make sense, doesn't it? Like maybe, just maybe, I'm building to some sort of satisfying conclusion. I mean, I'm gesticulating as though I am. I'm pacing, I'm growing in intensity, I'm taking off my glasses, which, by the way, are just frames. <laughs> I wore them to look smart, even though my vision is perfect. <laughs> and now I'm going to slow things down a little bit. I'm going to change the tone. I'm going to make it seem like I'm building to a moment. And what if I was? <laughs> Amazing, isn't it? What can you do? Life's a roller coaster. <laughs> you know, <laughs> if there's one thing you take away from my talk, I'd like you to think about what you heard at the beginning. And I'd like you to think about what you hear now. Because it was nothing, and it's still nothing. Think about that. <laughs> or don't, that's fine. And now I'm going to stop talking. Thank you. Kakatawa, no? <laughs> Let me share my slides again. OK, so it seemed like there was no content. But there is. He actually presented how to deliver a TED Talk. So the main message is here is that you must be aware of how you look and how you sound on stage or in our case now on Zoom because that knowledge will give you confidence. So this morning before I started um, logging into Zoom, to the Zoom meeting room, I did the Zoom room by myself and I recorded a portion of my talk so that I will know if my mic is good if I look good on the camera. So that's very important that you should really know how you look and how you sound on stage or on Zoom because that will give you confidence. Confidence is the key. You have to own your speech. Whenever you talk, you're basically selling a product. And that's not just your content, but also yourself because confidence matters a lot. One of the topics that I, all, I usually discuss when I do public speaking is social media marketing. So I did it for, I've done it for years. I went to different locations talking about it. And ev almost every time after my talk, I, will feel, I would feel good. So that's an indication that I did well. And there was one time that I was going to talk about the same topic again. And my boss was right in front of me. I felt my heart pumping fast and... At the end of the talk, I felt terrible. So my confidence went somewhere. I was nervous because I was not confident enough. So how do we gain confidence? Number one is you master what you're going to talk about. So master what you know because knowledge will be your armor. You won't be scared to be asked 
a lot of questions about that topic if you have mastered that knowledge. Number two is to improve how you look. So I'm not talking about jewelries, about makeup. If that's not your thing, it's okay not to put on makeup. And it's not about your, what you're going to wear. This is what you want to achieve. When you look at yourself at the mirror, you should have the feeling that you look great. You have to know that look. And do that so if you're wearing if you want to wear the same clothes over and over again because that makes you feel good then wear it over and over again so since we're in zoom and this is a webinar it's just half the effort or one third of the effort because only the headshot is same so when we go back to our college days or in the university when a stranger enters the room it's so easy to pinpoint who's the instructor or the professor simply by the way how the way the professor dresses up or how he um builds himself so the same goes in the zoom room or public speaking you must brand your value by the way you look so number three to gain confidence i'm saying this again practice builds confidence okay practice doesn't make perfect it's it's i think almost impossible to go perfect but it will build you it will build your confidence so type it type this on the chat box now practice builds confidence okay so we're done with the first part of of my talk so as we move to the next topic let me drink and if you want to get weekly updates on crop biotechnology or modern biotechnology, please click this link. I'm going to type it now on the chat box. Subscribe. Okay. So you can go to that link and just enter your email address. Then we'll send you a weekly update on modern biotechnology for free. Okay. Thank you for your... For your comments, practice builds confidence. Okay, let's go to science communication. Have you ever experienced going inside a class or a seminar room wherein the scientist or a speaker is talking and then your brain just shuts down because of the jargons you're hearing? You get bored to death. And what you want to do is just get your phone and tap on the uppercase red letter n on your phone screen so this happened to me a lot in college when i was studying biology so thankfully there was no netflix yet during that time so what is science communication it's simply communicating science using appropriate skills media activities dialogue to produce one or more of the following personal responses so this is a e i o u awareness, enjoyment, interest, opinion forming, and understanding. So psycho may sound simple, but it's actually a multifaceted field, including various disciplines in, such as science outreach, science popularization, science PR, and scientific marketing. So SciCom demands not just knowledge about science, but about technology, about IT, about journalism, about visual communication. That's why in our team at ISA, our SciCom team at ISA is composed of, of scientists, we have writers, we have um, designers, we have IT, because we want our approach to be holistic and effective. Why do we need to communicate about biotechnology. So if you read the news, you will see different kinds of um, articles or you will you can see, all see this on TV. So there's a strong resistance about biotechnology because it's a complex um, body of knowledge. We need to translate so that people would understand. Any misunderstanding or miscommunication can lead to fear. And as regulators, I know you're not required to promote about biotechnology, but um, there will be a lot of times when you will be asked to provide facts about biotech. And hopefully, you will be able to answer those questions in a way that will be understood and appreciated by the public. 
So several studies have shown that when people understand biotechnology, they tend to have positive attitudes about it. Here are just some examples of those studies. And this also coincides with the recent study on COVID-19. It has found that people who do not grasp science easily give in to conspiracy theories or the fear of the unknown. If Marie Curie would rise from the grave and speak to those who fear technologies, she would definitely say this again. Nothing in life is to be feared. It is only to be understood. Now is the time to understand more so that we may fear less. So as regulators, you will be, as, as I've said, you will be asked frequently about the safety of biotech products. And you must be able to confidently answer which is safe and unsafe. And when you answer such questions, you have to aim to target the three organs of communication, the head, heart, and gut. So you target the head by providing them with um, fact-based information. And then you target the heart by delivering the message, considering where they are coming from, what are their feelings. And then you target the gut by speaking the message with credibility, with style, and confidence. So at ISA, we have an operational framework of communicating biotechnology. So let me share some techniques for each step in the process. So we start with identifying the audience. So in communi communication, it is important that we know who we are talking to. For example, um, the way you communicate about something to your spouse is different on how to talk to your five-year-old kid. So we cannot say that we target the general public because targeting the general public is targeting nothing. It's like firing gun anywhere. So you have to focus and you have to aim. So once you have identified that specific audience, you can now study their characteristics and behavior by, you can ask them questions, you can do survey, or putting yourself in their shoes. Try to understand their concerns, their value, their views, and their knowledge. Now that you know you're, who you're going to talk to or you're going to communicate with, um, find the message that they need and look for compelling angles based on your audience. So one of the tools that we use to achieve this clear and accurate messaging is the message mapping. So you choose um, a main message and then get three or three to five supporting points. So when you deliver these messages, of course, you start with your main point, with your main message, and then you mention the most important point first, followed by the least important, and lastly, the second most important. So why, we follow, why do we follow this order? Because the first point is usually what sticks to your audience, as well as the last point. Anything in between usually gets lost somewhere or forgotten. So this is an example of a message map. Now let's go to communication strategy. So we use different kinds of strategies. So some of these are borrowed from communication, from marketing. And one strategy is, pos is positive messaging. And Save the Children is definitely not practicing it. If you look at their website, you will see depressing pictures of children. And when you read their content, you will see negative words such as war, refugee, health, emergency, fears and casualty sore, so words like that. And I think it's effective for them, but if I, if I were to choose, I don't want to, my message to be linked with fear because when the fear is gone, there will be no engagement anymore. And water.org hits this right on the spot. So when you look at their website, you will feel good and hopeful. So instead of saying there's a water crisis and everybody might die if you don't help, they just said opportunity starts with safe water. Just by saying it made me feel good. Another um, strategy is um, using or recruiting champions. So sometimes they're not the best person to deliver a certain message. Get champions. For example, James Reed has been um, assigned as 
an ambassador to promote food security. And because of that, people are giving attention to the cause. So it's also good to humanize. So why, what do we mean by you? humanize you make it re relatable to humans because we're humans so if you're gonna use pictures and you're you want to talk about farming so don't just put there a snapshot of a rice farm you can get a picture of a satisfied rice farmer another way to humanize is to tell stories so storytelling is a buzzword now especially in social media so years ago, we did a study with John Templeton Foundation about the adoption and uptake pathways of GM crops. So we interviewed farmers from China, Philippines, and India about how they benefited from biotechnology. So we compiled their answers and we came up with a booklet titled Farmers First. So this is actually one of our most distributed publications and it's timeless. Another strategy is to use metaphors or representations. This is um, used to simplify complex concepts. So this is an example of a winning piece from our contest, Biotech Tunes. So it depicts how biotechnology can help farmers by combating pests, diseases, and other enemies. Another technique is using infographics. So this infographic is a summary actually of a 100 page report on GM crop adoption. So it has fewer words, compelling visuals, good for visual learners, and it's easier to convey the message to the audience, especially to the non academics. So now, now that you, you've chosen your strategy, you can go to the channels that you will use. And that is really crucial. According to Dr. Cleofetoris of DevCom and UPLB, at the initial phase of informing about a technology or a product, you can, you can use mass media and social media to create awareness. It's very effective. But moving towards commercialization, you have to... Um, execute more interpersonal activities. So for example, an, um, Apple is going to release a new iPhone. So before they release that, they, they um, release pictures on social media or in blogs like that. And then when it's already available, they contact influencers to try the, Apple, the new iPhone and then write about their reviews. So that's just one simple example. It is also important that you have a network because um, having partners makes you more credible. And at ISA, we value collaborations. So we have 20 biotech information centers, um, mostly in developing countries, and they help us implement our SICOM initiatives. Lastly, you have implemented your strategy through different channels, now you must have feedback mechanism. So it is important to assess the effectiveness of your SICOM activity. So you have to set metrics to evaluate your performance. For instance, for our publications, we measure the media impressions. We check out the, the tone of articles that were released about our publications. Are they positive, neutral? Are they negative? What are the countries that were interested on this topic. So we do that, we have metrics. Also, we do um, surveys for our subscribers, for our um, users. So we ask them, what are we good at? What do we need to improve on? What do you need that we can help you with? So we ask them regularly. And then um, you should also have a crisis communication plan. If something doesn't work out, what are you? What is the plan B? What is the plan C? So we also laid that out. So that's basically how we roll out our communication plans for biotech and biosciences. So before my last topic, let me see your reaction button to let me know if you're still there. Thank you. So in the next few minutes, I have a few slides left. I'm going to present references that you can use if you need more information on biotechnology. So if you Google the word GMO, this is what you will find. Lots of negative stuff. 
So it's important to have the proper judgment to choose from these sources. So most of the next slides I will show you are about AISA. So because I would like to let you know about the valuable resources on modern biotechnology that we offer to the public for free. So to those who doesn't know AISA yet, um, ISA or International Service for the Acquisition of Agribiotech Applications is an international NGO with centers in Southeast Asia, Africa, and America. So we aim to facilitate informed decision making among different stakeholders, especially in the developing countries, through various initiatives. And our flagship resource material is the annual brief on global biotech crop adoption. So we're the most authoritative source of information of data on global biotech adoption. So our latest brief is brief 55, which has the 2019 adoption data. We're currently um, working on the next for the 2020 adoption data. And then our brief 54, which was released last year, reach about 15,000 news reports, scholarly articles, and social media posts talking about that report. And we had close to 86 million media impressions. So if you want to have a copy of the executive summary of our latest report, just give me an email or send me an email later. We also have website resources. So um, we chose special topics such as um, COVID-19, genome editing, and BP eggplants. So if you go to our website, isa.org, isaa.org, so you will see this resource pages. What will you see inside there are crop biotech articles and publications that we have developed, also videos and scholarly articles that are related to each of those topics. So I already invited you to to subscribe to our e-newsletter. We deliver that every Wednesday. And we have a global reach of close to 24,000 all over the world. And we bring you research and news updates on modern biotechnology and genome editing. So this is also one of our main products, the GM approval database. So it presents an easy to use database of GM crop approvals. So you will see there, what are the events that have been approved for planting, for food, feed, and processing. So we use publicly available English or translatable decision documents of the approving countries and put them there or from biosafety clearing houses of the Convention of Biological Diversity and other peer-reviewed um, scholarly articles. So if you don't find what you need from ISA, you can go to the geneticliteracyproject.org. So they deliver naman daily news on food and agriculture, also human research. And check out they, their page because they also have this um, gene, global gene editing regulation tracker. It's an interactive um, database. So it provides you information on country regulations on gene editing and gene drives. It's very techy. Okay, another source that you can go to if you have questions on modern biotechnology is the GMO Answers. So this used to be an initiative by um, USDA, but now it's under CropLife International. And what they do is that they collect what are the most asked questions by the public on modern biotech. And then they invite experts from leading academic institutions and industry groups to answer those questions, share their knowledge, and whatever they would like to share about that certain issue. Now, these are the sources that you should not use because these are fake news sources. So don't use them. I know you're familiar with them. Take a picture if you must. So they are our certified biotech critics compiled by biotech scientists. And because of them, we have jobs to do on science communication. So this is my last slide. I would like to um, share last story. Um, I, I attended a seminar years ago about internet marketing. And one of the guest speakers was from a, an antibiotic um, organization or a biotech critic. So he was asked, what is your secret? Why are you 
why are you so successful on doing your campaigns against biotechnology, against other environmental issues? So he spilled the bins and he said that it's because every one of us, all the staff, all the volunteers are required to spend at least one hour a day to contribute to the campaign. So they're really very vigilant. And uh, us, for us who know something about biotechnology, if we don't communicate science, there will be no science. So lately, I've been receiving a lot of questions from friends about COVID vaccine. And it's not my job to promote vaccination or to promote the vaccines. I don't work for the companies that develop them. But I feel that it's that I have a part in, in sharing information about getting vaccinated. Because if I don't, this pandemic might not end. So now is the best time to do to explain about science or biotech because it's on the headlines. Many ears and hearts are open and it takes practice. For me, my practice is to teach science to my kids. I have a seven-year-old and a five-year-old kid that I homeschool. So expert psychom experts say that if you can explain biotech to a 12-year-old or to your grandma, then you are successful in popularizing biotech. So just remember to use the five T's if ever you're going to talk in public. Follow the biotech framework for SciComm and check out the ISA website if you, have, if you need more resources on modern biotechnology. That would be all. Thank you. Good morning. Right. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Ms. Uh, Teen Grace uh, Tome, for your uh, very uh, informative and I would say fantastic presentation on your assigned topic. Thank you so much, uh, Ma'am Christine Tome. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, you may now you may now send your co uh, comments or questions to uh, Ma'am Teen uh, Tome presentation. And we will be having our open forum uh, after the last presentation. Okay, thank you so much, Paul. And uh, again, I, uh, we would like to uh, uh, acknowledge the presence of, uh, of our participants from uh, the Department of Agriculture, RFO2, RFO5, RFO8. DARFO 12, DARFO uh, Cordillera Administrative Region, the uh, DA Bureau of Animal Industry, DA PCC, DA uh, Bureau of Fisheries and Aquatic Resources, DA Quirino Experiment and uh, Station, DA RFO 2 Nueva Vizca Experiment Station, the Department of Environment and Natural Resources. Uh, the Environment Management Bureau, Department of Science and Technology, the Department of Health, Food and Drug Administration, the uh, International Service for the Acquisition of Agri Biotech Applications or the ISAA, DOH Biosafety Committee, United States Department of Agriculture, Foreign Agriculture Service, and DA Biotechnology Program Office. So uh, I think uh, uh, marami tayong natutunan sa naging uh, topic or presentation ni Ma'am Tom. Uh, and now, uh, we will now move on to uh, the next uh, presentation. So for our second speaker, she has a help from the bio biosafety policies of the Philippines, including the first national biosafety policy, the first policy on GM crops regulation, and related issuances and the present national biosafety policy uh, executive order number 514 series of 2006. She has uh, served as technical consultant on the uh, Philippine Congress in the drafting of the Agriculture and Fisheries Modernization Act of 1997. The, and also the uh, Organic Agriculture Act of 2010 
and the Agriculture and Fisheries uh, Mechanization Law of 2013. She served as the technical advisor in drafting the implement, uh, implementing rules and regulations of the Rice Tarification Law of 2019. She also led a team of experts at the UPLB Foundation Incorporated in crafting policies on disaster risk reduction and management in agriculture. She is a former professor in molecular biology and biotechnology at the University of the Philippines, Diliman, and has held a various academic and scientific positions in other institutions and on policies and programs on biotechnology and climate change to the Department of Agriculture. Dr. Halus has, has established the first functional forensic DNA laboratory in the country and is instrumental in the acceptance of DNA evidenced by the Philippine Supreme Court in 2001. She is presently the president and chair board of directors by Technology Coalition of the Philippines. Serve as consultant and capacity building in biotech regulation biotechnology program office at the Department of Agriculture. And also she serves as the technical advisor to the Climate Resist Resilient Agriculture Office of the DA. Dr. Halus holds a BS Agriculture uh, Agronomy Plant Building, magna cum laude at the University of the Philippines and a Doctor of Philosophy in Genetics from the University of California, Berkeley, USA. Dr. Halos and her husband, Ponciano, are uh, commercially producing and distributing their patented biotech invention, a microbial seed inoculant for crops. So ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to present the uh, Dr. Saturnina Halos to present the agricultural biotechnology and organic agriculture. <laughs> Thank you very much. Mas mahaba yata introduction kaysa yung aking presentation. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Yeah, I'm going to talk. Actually, pinakyaw yung aking ano eh, yung aking presentation. Um, kay kayo ha, masyado ng advance yan. Okay, so ang assigned na topic sa akin, current state of the art technologies, syempre sa GM, sa genetic engineering yan, regulatory landscape of selected foreign countries, and relevant domestic laws and agency mandates pertinent of course to the regulations of GM animals. So that's going to be the topic I'm going to talk about, uh, the current state of art technologies in animal cloning, genetic genetic engineering and genome, gene and genome editing. And we we'll look at the, the regulatory landscape of selected countries and of course our own domestic laws and agency mandates pertinent to GM animal regulation. Um, okay, now let's talk about animal cloning. Why clone? Um, one is of course is the faithful reproduction of priced cows, horses, and pets. Another is the creation of experimental animal models for the study of human diseases. Uh, the first one actually is referred to as Harvard mouse. It is used for studying cancer. Faithful reproduction of GM animals for the production of medicine. And this is uh, what we often refer to as bioreactors, where you have animals uh, like uh, the goat that produces uh, an anti-thrombin in its milk. So these are all now commercial uh, processes. They're in the market and uh, you have to pay to be able to, do, to clone what animal you want to, to have. And of course, uh, you know, the, star, the first animal, cloned animal, wherein the nucleus is taken from a mature cell, actually, you know. Uh, previously, we had clones wherein the embryos are, you know, are divided and things like that. But in this case, you have truly a, um, a nucleus from a mature animal, which is uh, the uh, contributor of the DNA in the uh, embryo. And the embryo is made from, uh, an egg cell is taken from another sheep 
and uh, the egg cell was uh, the enucleated and uh, the nucleus from the mature cell of another sheep is the one that is transferred into this enucleated uh, cell, egg cell, and the egg cell is now induced to become a blastocyst and eventually into an embryo and then uh, transferred into a surrogate uh, sheep. So, and the uh, final product, of course, is a sheep that looks uh, like the uh, sheep wherein the nucleus is uh, contributed. Okay. So that was a very clear case of, uh, of cloning. And uh, from there on, there has been many thousands of, uh, of animals that's, that has been cloned. So this is now a commercial process. And then we have, of course, uh, in animal, uh, what is new in animal cloning is basically this uh, cell cloning wherein spare organs are manufactured. And this is the new, new uh, field regenerative medicine. And uh, previously, embryos were created through this uh, single cell nuclear transfer using and uh, stem cells are, uh, regenerate, are generated <clears throat> so that uh, <clears throat> these cells are <clears throat> induced to um, develop into organs like kidney, heart, and stuff like that. But there are ethical issues on the use of the created human embryos because these are now human embryos and they're considered life. And therefore, you know, uh, using them in research, some of these will be uh, thrown away actually, which is basically is like killing humans. So there's a very big ethical issue in there. And therefore, uh, this technique is only used for research so that, you know, it provides the uh, materials uh, simply for, uh, for, for uh, what's this, uh, setting up the conditions wherein you can produce a particular organ actually. There's a uh, similar technique the, this time, these are uh, this is um, using cells that are similar to embryonic cells that can be obtained uh, in vitro from adult cells, and this is developed by a uh, scientist, uh, Dr. Yamanaka, Japan, and these are referred to as induced pluripotent cells, and they can be induced to form human organs, and this is referred to as cell line engineering. And uh, there are two techniques that are used here, not just genetic engineering, that is the transfer of human genes into the cells, but also gene editing. And this is a very active area of research. And hopefully we will no longer have to get uh, human organs from dead, you know, uh, uh, newly died, uh, individuals or even from poor people who have to sell their organs to be able to give. Now in genetic engineering, there are already commercial uses of genetic engineering. Uh, the first one is uh, these disease models, GM mice and mouse that are used to study disease development and the uh, uh, creation of new pets like the um, the glowfish, for example, is the uh, new, is the uh, first commercially uh, produced uh, pet in the market. And then, of course, bioreactors. There are already, I think, a hundred animals that are now used as bioreactors. They produce uh, special therapeutic uh, proteins from humans in their, usually in the milk. And then the uh, the milk containing the protein is uh, you know is uh, passed through a series of uh, of uh, isolation procedures to be able to uh, isolate that therapeutic protein and is then formulated for um, for medicine. Of course, uh, genetic engineering is, has been applied in livestock and fishes in, in China. They're very active in the production of uh, uh, livestock for, you know, with better muscular structure. And then the first uh, 
first genetically engineered animal for food is the uh, genetically engineered salmon, which is now in the market. And this one grows faster, twice as fast, let me see, twice as fast, yeah, than the, uh, than the wild sal salmon or the, uh, or the trad traditionally cultured salmon. So as far as, uh, well, you know, they would claim this as a good, uh, good uh, technology for climate change because you need only half the amount of inputs to be able to produce the marketable size of the salmon. Pest control, we have genetically engineered mosquitoes that, would, that is used to control the population of uh, the dengue carrying or chingunyuk, uh, ching, what's it, Zika carrying or other virus, uh, pathogenic virus carrying mosquitoes. And that's also already on commercial uh, applications. And then for environmental monitoring, they have this, uh, actually there are fishes that are used also for environmental monitoring. They would change, they would glow if there is a, uh, if the uh, water, for example, would contain a, um, a huge amount of the polluted. That's, uh, I think the first one that was developed for commercial use here is a uh, frog. So this is the procedure for genetic engineering. You know, it's more complicated than in plants because the DNA has to be introduced into a <clears throat> fertilized egg, into the male pronucleus of the fertilized egg. Gene editing is the current trend actually in genetic engineering. And there has been a study, market study made only and the, the result was uh, just uh, published last month. And uh, the projection is that by 2026, the Asia Pacific gene editing market is projected to surpass 2.1 billion. And uh, the major products in here would be crops using CRISPR uh, CS9 technology. And uh, cell engineering is uh, also projected to be a key contributor to the market and Japan is the likely biggest contributor uh, to the uh, research uh, effort. In North America, genome, ed genome editing market is estimated at 1.4 billion, which is less than the Asia Pacific uh, market. As you can see we have the bigger uh, gene editing market Although it says that it's 1.4 billion actually in 2019, and it's supposed to grow by 14.7% uh, between 20 and 20, 2020 and 2026. And this is because of the vast demand for synthetic genes. And uh, zinc finger nu uh, nucle nucleases is the one that is being the major technology that is used. See? Uh, the the uh, market actually in North America is segmented into CRISPR, CS9, and then the uh, ZFN uh, segments. And the chief growth of the market, of course, will be on uh, medicines. And uh, the major targets are genetic disorders. In Europe, gene editing market is to attain 2.6 billion by 2026. And uh, because there are more, there are more startups, and uh, and also there's already a, an effort by the government also to provide funding for gene editing. And the reason for the market growth is the the presence of clear regulatory guidelines. And there's a very active area of research in gene editing to improve livestock production. Now, the regulation of gene and genome edited products. Most of GM products regulation in other countries is based on the Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety. And that's also true in the Philippines. Our Philippine National Biosafety Framework is designed, particularly designed, we got, you know, DNR got a grant actually from UNEP, I think. Uh, so in the... Uh, 
the objective is really to design and implementing uh, implementation uh, protocol for the Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety. Now, the regulated article in Cartagena, Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety is the LMO. And the LMO, or Living Modified Organism, is defined as an organism, a living organism produced through modern biotechnology containing a new combination of genes. Okay. And that's very critical because in genome or gene editing, there are two types of products. You have LMOs and mutants or the equivalent of mutants. Basically, gene editing, the other objective for gene editing is to target a mutation within genes. That's basically what the other product is, mutants. LMOs are regulated under our MBF. Non-LMOs, you can have voluntary registration with the uh, NSIC, that's the National Seed Industry Council, and that's for plants. For dogs, uh, you have registration with the Philippine Canine Club, but I'm not sure if we have, you know, I've been looking into any registration on livestock breeds, but uh, I don't know if we have one. Um, one way actually is to ensure that uh, you're getting the kind of product that you have is to monitor uh, the other products, the non-LMO products, and you can monitor this only if you can have a, uh, if, you, if you require registration with a certain body so you can monitor what's happening. Uh, monitoring is very important. Uh, for example, in the US, they were able to produce this small company, uh, produced a gene edited cow uh, that, uh, that were in the, uh, the gene for the horns was uh, silenced. That it, uh, you know, it, does, it is a hornless cow. And they started, um, what's this, uh, submitting this for. Uh, uh, to to ensure that and you know to claim that it cannot be regulated under the GMO framework, and uh, one of the researchers of USDA, you know, out of curiosity, what we did was to look at all the uh, at all the uh, DNA, the uh, what is the sequence the DNA that has been introduced in producing a the gene edited cow. And he looked at the sequences in the, in the genome of the cow and he found out that the sequence for the um, antibiotic resistance gene was actually integrated into the cow genome. Therefore, that cow is not simply equivalent to a mutated cow, but actually it contains a new gene and therefore it is an LMO. So the, uh, that cow is now, uh, what is this? It was supposed to be introduced in several countries as a um, uh, to be used as a uh, what is as a sire. You don't call it sire in in cows, right? As the bull, I should say, um, the contributor of the sperm. Okay, so that's the bull, and uh, they have withdrawn this uh, aspect because. Uh, it turns out that it is an LMO and it should be regu regulated as an LMO. But others, uh, there are already products in the market that have been shown not to contain any other genes, except that it has a mutation in one of the, in the, in the target gene. Okay, so let's move on to another topic, the regulatory framework of selected countries. Let's look at Canada. Canada has a federal regulatory framework for biotechnology. What it is, it that it builds on existing laws and institutions, and the federal regulatory departments agreed on how they're going to do this. They have, you know, they, they um, adopted the, the same principles and they have, uh, assign the different uh, dif different regulatory um, function for each of the department. Now the uh, regulation of biotechnology biotechnology products in Canada is also based on an existing regulation already that they they regulate new products or novel products so that all 
new varieties or new breeds that have been developed, whether from uh, genetic engineering, gene editing, or traditional biotech or traditional breeding is regulated in the same uh, framework. In the USA, they have this coordinated framework for the regulation of biotechnology. Uh, it, was, uh, it was formulated in 1986 and it has been uh, updated twice. Again, like Canada, it builds on existing laws and institutions. And uh, the, sorry. Ay, teka yung ha. Ito ba yung nakaano ako? Sorry. Okay. And uh, the federal oversight focuses on the characterization of the biotechnology product and the environment in which, into which it's going to be introduced and not the process by which the product is created. So, you know, the, the, here they, they talk about the product itself, not, not, the, not the process, how it was used. In Australia, they have this uh, Gene Technology Act, and then you have also the uh, Gene, sorry, ano bang nagawa ako na naman dito? Hindi ko natuloy makita, sorry, 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 sorry. Male, male. Okay, the act uh, created the position of a gene technology regulator, which is an independent statutory uh, office holder responsible for administering the act. So, all, yeah, I would like to go back to say that in Canada and the USA, yeah, there is no single entry for application for a GM product, unlike in the Philippines. Uh, in those countries, you apply to the different agencies for uh, permission, whatever permit that they're going to give to the product in their own mandates. So there is no, um, called, uh, there is no single entry for application. Now, that's not true in Australia because they have this gene technology uh, regulator who are in all applications for permit to use a particular GM product would go through. Although what it does also, it coordinates with other regulatory agencies rather than create a new office, for example, for food safety, there is FISANS and then for, uh, for, uh, other, uh, for other uh, safety issue, you have all the other agencies. But the other uh, difference here also is that the states, different states and territories can have their own regulation on GM products. And that is why some uh, states in Australia banned actually the uh, planting of GM, GM products. Now, the gene technology regulator reports directly to the Australian par parliament. Um, here, let me just show you. Hirap naman itong aking ano, saglit lang ha. At uh, nahihirapan ako dito sa aking presentation. Oops. Oops, 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 oops. Nasaan na ba ako? Uh, just uh, to get an example here of how the different products are regulated uh, by, the other, by the different agencies. Canada, you have the, um, this food uh, agency uh, which uh, regulates veterinary uh, biologics, the Pest Management Regulatory Agency of Health Canada regulates pest control products. Environmental Canada and Health Canada would, uh, would regulate all living products of biotechnology for uses not covered under other federal legislation. Health Canada regulates novel foods, fisheries and oceans Canada regulates the aquaculture industry in order to protect fish and fish habitat. So the, uh, the method by which you would culture a GM fish is regulated by Fisheries and Oceans Canada and the safety as food of that, of that GM fish is regulated by Health Canada. Oops, bakit nasa na ba ako? Ba't nagkaganito? Ah! Bumalik, bumalik. 
Hmm. Sorry. Okay, in the USA, you have the Environmental Protection Agency, which regulate pesticides and other chemical substances that may be present, that may present an unreasonable risk of injury to health and of the environment, and also including an unreasonable risk to a potentially exposed or susceptible population. Food and Drug Administration would regulate human and animal food and drugs and uh, the GM animal for the food and drug market. And the basis of the regulation, actually, I don't know if I'm going to mention it later also, is that the, uh, the transfer gene in a GM product is considered a drug under the Food and Drug Administration. It is regulated as a drug. That makes it very, very difficult. U.S. Department of Agriculture uh, regulates the commercial supply of meat, poultry, and egg products, and products that may cause or spread animal pests and diseases or risk. And also, it also regulates uh, veterinary, veterinary biologics. The U.S. Fish and uh, Wild Service, Wildlife Service of the Department of Interior, regulates fish, wildlife, uh, plants, and their habitats. And the National Marine, Service, uh, Marine Fisheries Service of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration of the Department of Commerce would regulate ocean resources. In the European Union, they create or they, uh, they formulated new policies. Actually, they have all these laws one, two, three, four, five that regulates GMOs, okay? So it covers the different aspects or activities with GMOs. And it is uh, this regulated, uh, this regulation is supplemented, oops, sorry, no nangyari. By a number of implementing rules or uh, recommendations and guidelines on more specific aspects. The European Commission has oversight on the implementation of these laws by its country member of the EU. Uh, but, and there's also a regulation that says that a member state may ban the cultivation of GMOs in their territories. In Brazil, they have a single law, the Biosafety Law Number 11, uh, 105 of March 24, 2005. And it created a national technical commission responsible for all regulation of the biotechnology sector. And uh, the GM product must go through five different st stages before it can be sold. In the Philippines, the uh, GM plant has to go through three stages. You have the uh, contained stage, and then you have the multiple uh, field trial stage, and then the commercial uh, regulatory phase. There are several regulatory issues that are associated, of course, with GM animals. And there are already international guidelines that we can use actually to, to guide us in developing our own guidelines. Because what we are developing right now is just this, uh, this basic uh, policy on the regulation of uh, GM animals. Uh, there will be specific, <clears throat> we should be formulating after an approval of this uh, uh, joint, uh, what we are trying to work on now is a joint uh, administrative order for the regulation of GM animals. And, uh, then, even, and then we'll have to develop or we'll, yeah, we'll have to formulate guidelines on how to ensure food safety guidelines on environmental safety and guidelines on animal welfare. And there are, uh, you know, it's uh, very fortunate for us because there are already uh, available guidelines uh, in other countries as well as uh, international bodies. Unlike when we started with uh, plant, the GM plants, uh, there were very few. And uh, in some cases, for example, in, uh, in the stock trade, uh, yeah, stock trade regulation, we had to develop our own, which other countries have copied. We have different uh, products of uh, GM animals. 
For example, we, we have GM animals that's going to be used for food. That's your GM salmon. And what are the environment? What are the issues that or concerns that are associated with this? If we are to grow this in the country, we have to look into the environmental safety. We have to look into the ethical issues. Uh, we have to look well. Now, if we're going to simply, well, of course, we'll have to look into food safety, product efficacy, and also the socioeconomic issues. Uh, but if we're going to import it, uh, we'll probably look into only in the food safety issue. And then the, the GM animals that are used for uh, pest control, we're going to introduce it, of course, because we're going to use it for pest control. We have to look into the environmental safety, the ethical issues, the product efficacy, and the socioeconomic issues. Um, GM animals that are for industrial uses, for example, the uh, silkworm that can produce silk for, uh, for the uh, textile industry. We have to look at the environmental safety if we're going to grow it here, uh, the ethical issues if there are any, product efficacy, of course, uh, that it produces the product that we want, and then if there are any socioeconomic issues. Bioreactors, again, if you're going to introduce it, actually, this could be a very good opportunity, a, uh, what's this, yeah, a uh, business opportunity for us in the country if we can have bioreactors that are already produced elsewhere and all we have to do is uh, grow them here maybe in our uh, export processing zones and then we can look of course well the environmental safety issue here is not that much because usually when you have an animal that is uh, developed as a bioreactor you're going to take good care of it you're not going to release it into the environment uh, probably only what you're going to look into, of course, uh, is the manure on how we are going to, to uh, regulate it. But there are already uh, regulation under the DNR that, uh, you know, that are already in place. And then ethical issue, uh, again, I don't think there is going to be any ethical issue in here. Of course, product efficacy is uh, very important that the animal that's going to be grown here would have would produce the same product as it has been shown elsewhere. And there, I, I don't think there is going to be any socioeconomic issue involved there. For environmental monitoring, of course, environmental safety, is there going to be ethical issue involved if it's an aquatic species that's under the fire, for example. And then product efficacy that it is working in this environment in the country, as well as it is shown in other countries. Uh, pet, of course, well, you know, all you're looking at is product efficacy, but if you're going to look at aquatic species, you know, we have had problems with um, aquarium species, you know, a species that has been introduced as aquarium uh, pets and they, they eventually get out and they, they uh, produce, uh, in, and we have environmental safety issues that are involved. Then of course for research, we are simply, this is highly regulated under the uh, DOST. And uh, of course, uh, the reason for the regulation is environmental safety and of course product efficacy, uh, that it is as, as useful as it is in research as it is in other countries. And, um, and that, well, it's, uh, it's in a contained environment. And we do have already uh, the guidelines for uh, conducting uh, GM animals under uh, contained environment. Oh, I think that's only for mosquitoes. <laughs> so uh, for uh, experimental animals, uh, I heard that the, it has been also introduced. There's uh, one or two laboratories that are using GM animals for experimentation. Now we have all these laws that uh, that mandates different agencies for the regulation of certain products. Uh, in the uh, animal industry, of course, uh, for food, uh, you have the, the land species, uh, you have two regulatory agencies in there, um, the production of the food itself, the production of the animal itself, the, uh, what's this, the housing and, and so on is regulated by BAE, and then the meat itself is regulated by NMRDS. For aquatic species, we only have the Bureau of Fisheries and Aquatic Resources. 
for pest control external to buildings. Uh, if it is health related, human health related, it's DOH. If it is agriculture related, it's FPA. And pest control that is internal to buildings because uh, this one would expose humans actually. And that's why DOH, the Food and Drug Administration, is the agency responsible for that. For gem animals that are for industrial use, that would depend on, on, on the organism itself. If, uh, for example, this is a, a silkworm or a bee, it's the Bureau of Animal Industry. Bioreactor, again, it depends on the final product. If you have medicine, then it is the DOH. If it is for pest control and uh, it is of agricultural application, it is the FPA. For environmental monitoring, of course, it's the uh, Environmental Mon Management Bureau. For pets, land species, it's the Bureau of Animal Industry. Aquatic species is the Bureau of Fisheries and Aquatic Resources. And for research, it is the UST. Now, when we say it is, this is the uh, main regulatory agency, uh, since uh, we follow the regulation, regulatory system for crops, this would be the agency wherein the application for use of the GM animal is fine. And uh, we also have other agencies that should be involved because it is part of their um, of their mandate for food safety assessment for land species. The, you have the National Meat Inspection Service. The food safety assessment is uh, for aquatic species is the Bureau of Fisheries and Aquatic Resources. Environmental safety assessment, it is the Environmental Management Bureau of the DNR. For ethical considerations of land species, it is the Bureau of Animal Industry. And ethical considerations for aquatic species is the Bureau of Fisheries and Aquatic Resources. So that's... Uh, what I can say about these topics, and thank you very much. Thank you so much for Dr. Halos for your wonderful presentation about cell cloning. Genetic engineering of animals, commercial uses are disease model, new pets, bioreactors, improved livestock, species, pest control, and environmental monitoring. And about the regulatory framework of selected countries, agencies involved in GMO regulation in other countries, and more. Thank you so much for Dr. Halo. Welcome. Okay. So, so before we carry on, po, I would like to say, uh, say thank you to our following participants from the Department of Agriculture, Regional Field Office 2, DARFO5, DARFO8, DARFO12, DARFO Cordillera Administrative Region, DA Bureau of Animal Industry, DA Philippine Carabao Center, DA Bureau of Fisheries and Aquatic Resources, DA Carina Experiment Station, DA RFO2, Nueva Vizcaya Experiment Station, Department of Environmental and Natu uh, Natural Resources, Environmental Management Bureau, Department of Science and Technology, Department of Health, Food and, um, and Drug Administration, International Service for the Acquisition of Agri Biotech Applications, DOH Biosafety Committee, United States Department of Agriculture, Foreign Agricultural Service, and DA Biotechnology Program Office. Maraming salamat po sa inyong lahat. And before po tayo uh, mag-proceed sa ating open forum, I would like to introduce again our moderator for our open forum. He is currently working as Head of Molecular Biology and Biotechnology Laboratory an Associate Professor 5 at the Department of Biological Sciences, College of Science, Central Luzon State University. Let us all welcome Dr. Jerwin R. Undan. Morning po, Doc. Hi, good morning, Nick. Uh, salamat for the uh, introduction. Uh, good morning po, uh, Ma'am Christine and uh, Dr. Hados. 
and to all our participants po, magandang umaga para sa last day po natin. Ano? Uh, before we proceed on our open forum, gusto ko lang pong batiin yung mga students ko from biology department, yung nagtitake up ng plant biotechnology, and also to Dr. Jemarlene Garcia, one of the faculty of the uh, vet med, CLSU. Okay, so good morning po, Ma'am Christine and Dr. Halos. Do you hear me clear po? Good morning. Dr. Halos? <laughs> Hello. Uh, apo. Clear Teacher. po, nadidilig niyo po ako, Ma'am. Ah, oo Dito naman. Po. Very clear, very clear. Okay. Uh, okay, let's start po our uh, open forum. So I think, uh, okay, I'll begin with... Uh, Miss Christine Po. Okay, the question is uh, today, the media is considered the best way to inform people of the products of biotechnology. However, the media still tends to exaggerate some of the side effects of these products in a bad way. How do you think the media should improve their information dissemination? Okay, thank you for that question. So we know the media, whatever topic, they tend to, not everybody, not all media practitioners, but most of them, they, they tend to sensationalize. Why? Because we see them on TV, we hear them on the radio, and they need to grab the attention of their audience. So they, they strategize. So one of their strategies is to sensationalize. And sometimes um, they miss um, giving the factual information. So what we do on our part, we partner with media practitioners. So we inform them about biotechnology. So simply just like this, we do this to, to media practitioners so that they will be informed and we form networks. We build relationships with them and we let them know that if you need information, contact us. Contact. We can help you connect with scientists like Dr. Halos. So we can help you connect with them so that you will get the accurate information that you will be presenting to the public. So that's very important, the relationship of the stakeholders, especially the media, because they're the frontliners in terms of information dissemination. Okay, thank you, uh, Ms. Christine. Uh, next question is addressed to uh, Dr. Halos. Uh, Ma'am? Okay, so ma'am, the question is, what are the major issues that need to be addressed or improved in the GMO regulation in the Philippines? Okay, in the Philippines. Yeah, well, of course, it's food safety issue. Then you have environmental issues. Those are actually the major biosafety issues that are being addressed anywhere in the world and also in the country. Uh, we have... Um, we may, we may include other issues like socioeconomic considerations, but in, for animal, animal regulation, actually, we need to include the ethical issue. That is, how do you treat the animal in your care? Okay, thank you, ma'am. Uh, another question for to both of you. Uh, okay. Do you think we should include representatives from the media in drafting policies for GM regulation? Um, actually, what we do in the Department of Agriculture is, uh, is to include the, actually the general public we present, we, we first prepare a draft and then we go around the country presenting this draft. And then we get uh, comments, whether it is from the press or from the general public, from other, uh, other government officials, that's what we do. And then we analyze whether uh, this is, uh, we can really include it in the regulation or we can explain why it is not uh, within the regulation. I think that would be the best answer <laughs> from Dr. Halos. So what we do also for, in terms of regulations, if there are um, drafted or new regulations, of course, we make the media involved by informing them as well. Okay. Uh, thank you, Ma'am Christine and Dr. Halos. 
Okay, another question to both of you. Uh, how is information on biotechnology or GMO products conveyed to consumers and the general public? Yeah, for, for me, you know, when, when we develop the biotechnology program of the Department of Agriculture, one of the components is actually IEC information education and communication. And uh, at the beginning, we already recognized that we really need to communicate the GMOs to the public. So that's a very, that's a continuing program of the Department of Agriculture. And we have been, you know, we have been very active actually in, uh, in uh, communicating with different sectors of the society from policymakers, for example, members of Congress, the staff of Congress, all the way down to the farmers and fisher folks. So, so we do have a very, active uh, communications program of the Department of Agriculture under the Biotechnology Program Office. And that has been for almost how many years? 20 years already? <laughs> yes, and even before a certain biotech product has been commercialized, we have steps naman before commercialization. So that requires PIS, right? Public Information Sheet. And not just that, but we also support it with different campaigns online and offline. So that even before a product has been commercialized, the, the public already have a certain level of knowledge about that product. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Thank you, I think I have a question here for uh, Dr. Halas. Uh, what is the difference between LMO, GMO, and mutants? Ah, okay. Yeah, LMOs are also referred to as GMOs, actually. These are products of modern biotechnology um, with, you know, a new or novel combination of genes. Mutants are simply... Um, products of either uh, chemical mutagenesis or uh, like in gene editing targeted mutagenesis, wherein uh, a few, one or few uh, nucleotides are being uh, changed. It's either, or you also can have insertion, you can have an additional one or two or a few nucleotides in a particular uh, gene or uh, a loci or a particular uh, point in the chromosome. So that's a very big difference because in, uh, in, um, in GMOs or LMOs, usually the gene that is introduced is from a different species. In mutants, you are not introducing any gene. Uh, the gene itself is already there in that species. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Uh... I think uh, that's all our questions for both of you. Uh, maraming salamat po, Ma'am Christine and Dr. Halos. Welcome, welcome. welcome. Okay, uh, take care po and God bless. Uh, okay, Nick, take a uh, chart for the remainder of the program. Thank you. Okay, Thank okay. You, you. I have other uh, things to do, so I'll leave you now. Bye-bye. It's bye -bye. safe. Dr. Halos. Okay lang po ba na i-award na po muna namin sa inyo certificate bago po kayo umalis? Okay, okay. <laughs> Sige po. So, let's proceed po sa awarding of certificate. So, um, from the DOSC, DADPO, and our CP Division 13, PCC, and LBC present this certificate of appreciation to Ms. Christine Grace and Tome for her time and expertise as a resource speaker during the Livestock Biotechnology Center virtual seminar workshop on GM animals for Philippine biotech regulators on March 17 to 19, 2021. Undersigned by uh, Dr. Claro N. Mingala, Chief of Livestock Biotechnology Center at Philippine Carabao Center and undersigned as well by Dr. Ronnie D. Domingo, OIC or Executive Director of the Philippine Carabao Center. Thank you, Podoc. Thank you. And to present this certificate of appreciation to Dr. Saturnina C. Halos, 
Thank you din po, Doc Halos. Thank you. Okay, ingat kayo lahat. May COVID pa rin. Thank you po, Doc. Ingat din po kayo. And present this certificate of appreciation to Dr. Jerwin R. Undan um, as, uh, for his time and expertise as a moderator during our workshop. Thank you din po, Doc Undan. Thank you, Mick. You're welcome. So, ano, sa mga participants po natin, mag-proceed muna po tayo sa ating recap about sa diniscuss po sa mga topics, yung dalawang topics po natin sa araw na ito. And for that po, we have um, one of our staff here in LBC, which is Miss Justine Salvador, a science research specialist one here at PCC, and she will do the recap po para, para sa ating mga participants. Morning, Miss Justine. Good morning, everyone. I am Justine Salvador um, from the Livestock Biotechnology Center, and today po, I'm going to recap the session for today. So, for our first speaker, we had Miss Christine Grace and Thomas, Program Associate from the International Service of the Acquisition of Agri Biotech Applications, and her topic is about the introduction to public speaking and communicating biotechnology. For the highlights of her presentation, um, we have the public speaking, biotechnication, resources in more modern biotechnology. So um, let's start off with the five pieces of public speaking. We have the topic and then the trees where in it includes arranging and organizing your, your talk. Then next is the trend where in the natin makikita yung style and technique and creativity ng ating, um, ng ating speaking, and then we have the thought and the tell. And then according to Ms. Tome, um, we always have to build our confidence in order for us to have a effective communication with our audience. And we have to know how do we look, look and sound so, we, so that we will be confident. And the um, key for them is to practice, practice, and practice. And then next slide, the communicating signs include the AEIOU, the awareness, enjoyment, interest, opinion forming, and understanding. And um, tinakil din po niya yung ating ISAS operational framework of biotech communication that includes identify the audience, develop key messages, design communication strategy and determine channels, establish network, create feedback mechanism, and then the modern biotech sources, which includes the new website resources, crop biotech updates, GM approval database. And the flash din po si Ms. Christine ng mga sites kung saan po tayo makakita ng mga fake news sources na dapat po natin iwasan. And then, um, na bigay din po siya ng um, isang quotation as before po siya mag-view na nasasabing, there can be no science without communication. Then we have, we had our second speaker, Dr. Saturnina C. Halos, President of Biotechnology Coalition of the Philippines. And her topic is the current state of the art technologies, regulatory landscape of selected foreign countries, relevant domestic laws and agency mandates pertinent to its regulation. So, ang highlight po ng presentation ni Dr. Halos is the animal cloning that includes faithful reproduction of rice, cows, horses, and pets, creation of experimental animal models for the study of human diseases, faithful reproduction of GM animals for the production of medicine. Um, kasali din po dito ang genetic engineering of animals na ginagamit for disease models, new pets, as bioreactors to improve livestock and fisheries, pest control, and environmental monitoring. Then, um, tinakal din po ni Dr. Halos ng regulation of gene or genome edited products 
regulatory framework of selected countries, international guidelines addressing specific regulatory issues, and Philippine main, Philippine main regulatory agency according to use agency and mandate. Uh, that includes the Bureau of Animal Industry, the Bureau of Fisheries and Aquatic Resources, and the OH Food and Administration, Food and Drug Administration. Then, kasali din po ang ating Philippine Minor Agencies in GM Animal Regulation na mayroon the A, National Meat Inspection Services, DNR Environmental Management Bureau, Bureau then a Bureau of Animal Industry, and the Bureau of Fisheries and Aquatic Resources. So this is the last session po for this activity and we hope po na madami po tayo natutunan sa ating mga speakers para po dito sa ating virtual webinar. Thank you po. Thank you so much po, Ms. Justine. And ngayon po, um, to formally close our webinar series, I would now I will give now the Zoom room to Sir John Louis P. Baligad, the team head of this event, for his closing remarks. Morning, to Sir Louis. Hello, uh, good morning. Magandang buhay po, magandang araw po sa ating lahat. And uh, first and foremost, uh, I would like to express uh, my appreciation to the speakers for uh, the daily uh, seminar workshop, for staying with us, for uh, to Dr. Kao, Dr. Mendoza, Ma'am Malu Agbagala, Dr. Paz Alberto, Sir uh, Abi Manalo, and of course, to, uh, Doc Ding Atabay, Miss Tin Atome, and, and the last but not the least, Dr. Saturnina Halus. And of course, to our moderator from day one until today, nasulit nasulit po, Sir Dr. Jerwin Undan. Sir, thank you so much uh, for the valuable contributions to our three-day seminar workshop on GM animals for Philippine biotech regulators. And of course, uh, my deepest gratitude goes to all uh, who attended, to our participants from different uh, DEA, regional field offices, different government agencies, academe, uh, and of course, from the USDA. Thank you so much for, for uh, uh, attending uh, this uh, seminar workshop. Okay. So before uh, we end or close this uh, event, I would like uh, to cite, okay, and emphasize this uh, uh, quote or message from the video of biotechnology na napanood po natin kanina during our waiting time from Dr. Javier. Javier. So, asabi niya dito, uh, we are not playing God, okay? God gave us the intellect to understand the complexity of God's creation. So, ma mahirap po kasi talaga i-convince yung ating po mga kababayan, okay po, uh, specifically sa mga organisasyon or samahan na talaga pong tinututulan po po yung uh, pagtanggap sa ating mga GM crops or animals products na uh, pwede itanim sa atin dito or yung mga papasok po sa ating bansa. And uh, gusto ko din isight yung isa pang quote from uh, the opening remarks of Dr. Clara Ingala na biotechnology it's parang hindi siya yung uh, hindi siya yung hindi lang siya business, okay? It's not a business it, uh, it's uh, parang uh, kailangan natin siya kasi ito yung trend, ito yung future natin na dapat na po natin sundan at huwag na po tayong babalik o magpapahuli, okay po para uh, towards a food secure community Okay, bo. And then finally, my deepest thanks, of course, to my uh, co-LBC staff and especially po sa aming head, Dr. Clara Emingala, na busy po ngayon. Marami po silang uh, uh, commitment po ngayong araw. Kaya po ako yung nabigyan po ng task na mag-closing for their priceless contribution, contributions and for running a, a smooth event like this po. And muli po, once again, uh, on behalf of the Livestock Biotechnology Center, PCC, the uh, DOST, NRCP Division 13, and of course the DABDO. Uh, thank you so much for staying with us. And uh, please, okay, 
please uh, wait for yung uh, mga further uh, announcement and reminders po before leaving this Zoom room. Thank you so much. And may I request again to Ms. Mitch Bondok to, uh, to take charge in the remaining part of the program. Thank you so much. Thank you so much po, Sir Louis, sa inyo po um, closing remark. And ngayon po, um, syempre, we've come to uh, the end session na po ng ating workshop. And I would like to invite all of us first for the photo session. Pwede po pa open na po yung mga camera natin. Okay. One, two, three, smile po. Tapa po. One, two, three. Yan. Thank you so much po sa ating lahat. And ano po, on behalf of Livestock Biotechnology Center and PCC, thanks again for joining us today. And we hope to see you all again on our next activity. And bago po tayo umalis, um, pwede ko po ba kayo i-request muna na mag-take po muna tayo ng post test natin. Isasend na po namin yung link sa ating chat box. Pakisend na lang po. Ay, pakicheck. And we will give 15 minutes po sa inyo para sagutan. And bag, pa, uh, bago po namin isara yung mismong post test. Thank you po. Uh... As uh, Ms. Ms. Mitch uh, said, uh, the participants who will complete okay, and submit the post test and post evaluation form will receive a certificate of completion. So uh, you may now start answering the uh, post test. Okay? And after you answer the post test, you uh, are also required okay, po, to uh, complete the post uh, evaluation form. Po. Thank you so much and God bless. Uh, biotechnology is a very important tool to develop products and, and technologies that can help in national development. And it's very important we all do our job, but it's also important that we become more innovative and imaginative. There's a, a big task of persuading ordinary people to understand and, and appreciate that, in fact, after 20 years of eating GMOs, nobody has gotten sick of GMOs yet. So we have to gather evidence sa Europa, sa America, na yung cornflakes na binibili natin dito is from BT corn. At wala pang kahit isang tao na namatay na kumain ng BT corn. We rely on, on uh, scientific studies, you know. And we know that right now, we have more than 800,000 hectares of uh, land in the country that are planted to GMOs. Why so so much? Because the farmers are really reaping economic benefits uh, from this and it's not just the farmers who are uh, benefiting but it's the industry around. Sa sector ng agrikultura, palakasin mo lang ang biotechnology that will address a lot of problems. Talagang resistance ng publiko napakalakas sa, sa GMO corn. Pag kumain tayo dyan, sabi niya, eh, kung yan, may, may bacteria yan eh. Baka mamatay tayo. I'm always reminded of a comment by Bishop Varela. And he was an early supporter of GMO. I asked him one time, say, how, how do you reconcile your 
your Christian, basic Christian, Catholic uh, background with the idea of advance some people that we are playing God. And the old bishop said, no, I don't see it that way. God gave us the intellect to understand the 